Hello everyone and welcome to our seventh webinar in the IELTS from start to finish series. Uh, tonight we're going to guide you through the steps you'll need to achieve an overall band seven on your test and also share some common mistakes that might stop you from achieving your desired score. Uh, tonight with us we have one of our foremost IELTS experts, Tina Hartnett, uh, who will be walking you through the masterclass and then answering questions for 15 minutes at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, if this is your first webinar, webinar, make sure to ask questions in the Zoom chat if you're tuning in there or in the comments on Facebook if that is where you're watching. Uh, as always, this video will be available uh, at the conclusion of the webinar on our Facebook page. Uh, Tina, without further ado, I'm happy to hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you to our IELTS Band Score, our masterclass, which is going to talk to you tonight about how to score seven and above. And as Sam mentioned, um, I'm going to give you some practical tips on hopefully mistakes you can avoid making during the test. I'll also talk to you about how you'll be scored and some costly mistakes that you can avoid making. So this masterclass will focus on the skills of reading, writing, speaking and listening. So we've got a really full presentation coming up in the next hour. So please hold your questions until the end. Now, in part of your preparation, you need to be deciding which IELTS test you're going to take, the academic or the general training module. The only two differences between those modules is the writing and the reading test. So let's get into it and we'll start by having a look at the reading test and we'll see what the masterclass advice is for this part of the test. If you do the academic test, it runs for 60 minutes. There are three sections to the test and you have to answer 40 questions. Now, all of the materials used in the IELTS test are originally designed for a non-specialist audience and are of general interest. So that means you don't have to have any specialist knowledge or training to do well in the test. At least one of the reading passages contains detailed logical argument. So as I said before, there are 40 questions with three reading passages. So you'll, there's between a total of, there's between a total of 2,200 to 2,750 words. Now that's a lot of words to read, but hopefully you won't be reading all of those words. Now, the difference with general training is that it has a different objective to the academic reading test. Its objective is to test language in a workplace or a work training context. So, for example, applying for a job, using workplace facilities or staff development, but still three sections and 40 questions to answer. And again, the same amount of words or similar amount of words to the academic test. Now, hopefully, um, when you do the test, as I said before, you won't be reading all of the reading passages. There'll be no need to. And what you need to do in your preparation is familiar, familiarise yourself with the range of question types that are used both in the academic and the general training. Now, these range of questions ensure that candidates are being tested on a variety of skills. And these skills can be categorised by the three terms, skimming, scanning and reading for detail. Now, the key purpose of these skills is to improve your reading speed and efficiency. So for those of you who aren't too sure about the difference, skim reading is when you're reading for the general gist, general gist sorry, or the main idea. So you're reading, your eyes are moving very quickly over the text. You're just really skimming over quite quickly all the words just to get the main purpose or content. And this is a skill that you would often use in your first language. You don't need to read every word or sentence. So try and practice this when you read in English. Scanning is when you're reading to locate a specific piece of information. So it could be a time, a date, a name, but usually just one specific piece of information. And reading for detail, that's intensive reading. So that's when you will need to read every word, but you'll only ever have to read part of a passage in detail. And this brings me to a common mistake in the reading part of the test, reading the whole text in detail instead of reading the questions first. Always read the questions first. That's so you'll find out what you have to do. 
So for example, if you have to match headings to sections of the passage, read the headings first so that you can focus on the main ideas you need to look for. Some candidates make the mistake of trying to read and understand every word. That's about 900 words in the reading passage. Whereas if you skim read the text, you might only, you might be able to answer six questions if it's matching headings to paragraph and then read just 300 words, say the last two paragraphs in detail to do a gap fill task with seven questions, okay? So as I said before, you don't need to be a specialist on the topic. For, so for example, if the text is about sharks, you don't have to be a marine biologist to get all the answers. The IELTS question paper production process is very strict and it's trialed extensively before any questions go live. So no candidates will be disadvantaged, no matter what their background is or what they've studied. So that's why we can say with confidence that IELTS tests your reading skills and not your knowledge. So you need to familiarise yourself with the different question types that you'll encounter on the reading paper. So um, there'll be 40 questions and there'll be a range of question types that are used because they all test different skills. So the answers come, so if we look at the, these question types here, multiple choice, identifying and the short answer, they've all got an asterisk next to them. That means that the answers come in the same order as the questions for most of those uh, question types. So this helps you find where to look for the right answers. But there might be matching inform um, information to a paragraph or matching headings to a paragraph or doing some sentence completion. You might have to complete a notes in a summary or a diagram or complete a table. You might have to label a diagram. There might be um, questions where you have to identify the writer's views or claims for such as yes, no, or not given, which let me just ask you, have a think about this. How often do you read a serious English language newspaper? I don't think we have the facility to do any polling during this webinar, but just think about how often do you read a serious English language newspaper or magazine? Is it every day, two or three times a week, once a week or rarely? And if you're answering number three or four, I would like to encourage you to do some more reading. Now, a common question type that you'll encounter on the reading test is a true, false or not given. So this is where you have to identify what the text is saying. And if the statement is true, then the statement in the question agrees with the information that's in the writing passage. If the statement is false, it contradicts the information in the reading passage. And if the, if the answer is not given, then that means there's no information at all in the reading passage about what's being asked in the question. Now, remember, the statements in the questions won't be expressed in exactly the same way as in the text. So look for key words in the statements and find similar words or phrases in the text. So when you're reading the questions, try and think of some synonyms for words that you, or words that are associated with the main words in the question. So remember I said to you before, read the questions first. So if we have a look at the first question, Aboriginal Australians are descended from the inhabitants of Africa, and we do some word association. We can think of another word form of descended is descendant. A synonym of descendant is ancestors. And again, if we do some skimming, we'll find we, we find the word ancestors in the second line of the first paragraph. Okay, so we're using skimming there to help us locate the answer. In the second question, ancestors of the Aborigines settled in Australia about 80,000 years ago. That means we're looking for a number. And we know when we skimmed the first paragraph, we saw 80,000. But again, if we're scanning, because we're looking for a specific number, we'll find 50,000 there in the second paragraph. And that might be a clue as to where we'll locate the answer. 
And the third question, Aboriginal Australians are the most genetically diverse race in the world. Again, if we're doing some scanning, we can see the words genetic diversity at the end of the second paragraph, and we see genetic diversity again in the third paragraph. So that's why it's helpful to read the questions first. So if we have a look at question number one, Aboriginal Australians are descended from the inhabitants of Africa. We can see that the answer is true. It tells us there in that first paragraph, in the first two lines, which we would have skimmed when we did our skimming at the beginning. The second question, is false because they arrived over 50,000 years ago. And we find that answer in the second paragraph, which again, when we did our scanning before, we would have known where to locate that. Now the reading for detail for the, for the true, false, not given type questions occurred in the third paragraph. And there's no information given about whether Aboriginal Australians are the most genetically diverse race in the world. It's talking about them being genetically diverse in Australia, but not the world. So there's no information given about that at all. So you can see how important it is to read the questions first and also get an idea of how you don't need to read every word in the text to find the answers. So always look for synonyms and be thinking of synonyms and of the main words in the questions when you're reading the questions first and look for distractions in that third paragraph. They talked about being culturally diverse, but it's not the same as being genetically diverse. So they, there was a little trick there just to try and um, get you thinking along a different track. So be aware of that. Now, my masterclass advice is always start by reading the questions and then decide which reading skill is being tested. Do I need to skim? Do I need to scan or read for detail? And only then go to the reading passage. When you are reading, don't be put off by any questions you don't know the meaning of at first. You can try to work out their meaning from the context and the surrounding words. I also recommend that you read any headings, titles or subtitles first and look out for footnotes with definitions of any technical terms. So this could be in the form of labelled illustrations. So, for example, if there was a reading passage on hieroglyphics um, uh, talking about early writing systems, there could be a labelled diagram to show you. Now, if you're doing the paper-based test, you must write your answers directly onto the answer sheet, okay? Because when you do the reading test on the paper-based reading test, you're given a reading test booklet and an answer sheet. So write your answers directly on the answer sheet. You're not given any extra time to copy your answers across. So make sure to answer them directly on the answer sheet. And if you're doing the computer-based test, you'll be entering your answers in on the screen as you go. Now, you've got to answer 40 questions in 60 minutes. So answer the questions that you find easiest first and then go back to any unanswered questions if you have time. Never, ever leave a blank answer on the answer sheet. It's always better to guess. And if you need to do any writing, if you're doing the paper-based test and you want to write some notes on your reading test booklet, you're allowed to do so. The examiner doesn't look at that booklet. And if you're doing the computer-based test, you're given a scrap piece of paper and a pen to make some notes. Okay, so let's move on now to the writing part of the test. And this is the test that candidates have the most uh, problems with. Now, as I mentioned before, whether you do the academic or the general training module, the differences lie in the reading and the writing test. So let's have a look at the academic writing test first. You've got task one, which is an information transfer task. So you're given information in a graph or a diagram and you have to transfer that information in the text. And task two is an essay. In the general training module, you have to write a letter in task one 
and you have to write an essay in task two, giving your opinion. Now I stress that giving your opinion because that's the English language skill you're being tested on in both task in both modules, academic and general training. In writing that essay, expressing your opinion is the language skill that the examiners are testing you on. So how you'll be scored. Now, if you have access to the IELTSessentials.com website, uh, you'll come across, you'll find on that website, the public version of the band descriptors. And there are four columns. There are nine rows representing each band score. And there are four columns talking about how you'll be scored. Now, each of these columns are weighted at 25%. Task achievement is for task one of the writing test, and that basically means how well have you answered the question. Task response is for task two in the essay, so how well have you responded to the question. The next criteria is coherence and cohesion. So that basically means how well does your message flow? Have you used linking words to connect your ideas together? Have you used paragraphing? That's very important. Next criterion is lexical resource, which is a fancy word for your vocabulary. So have you been able to use a wide range of words to express yourself precisely? Or have you used simple words repetitively? And the last criteria is grammatical range and accuracy. So again, have you used a wide range of grammar structures flexibly? Have you used um, a range and a mixture of simple and complex sentences? And that's how accurate are you in using those sentence structures? So this is the format of the question type for task one. You have to summarise in your own words information that's presented either in a graph, a table, a chart or a diagram. You must write 150 words and you've got 20 minutes. We recommend only spending 20 minutes on task one. So as I said before, this task is essentially an information transfer task. In other words, information is given to you in a visual format and you have to convert it into text. So try to imagine that you have to report on what you can see to someone you're talking to on the phone and they can't see the visual. So you have to identify the key information, the key features and give a summary to that person. So you should only spend 20 minutes on this task because it only counts for one third of the total mark. And you'll lose marks if you write less than 150 words. In the computer delivered writing test, there'll be a word counter which will show you the word count for each task. So we're now gonna take a look at a typical academic task one. So this one is asking you to compare two related graphs, a bar chart and a line graph describing the number of Japanese tourists traveling to Australia in a 10 year period. So you've got a bar chart and you've got a line graph there. So you've got to think about how you're going to set out this information. Are you going to uh, describe the bar chart first and then the line graph second. But think about also too how you're going to write your introduction. Think about how you're going to highlight the key features with figures and also think about your overview. And I'll talk more about the overview in a moment. Now the introduction is important. It includes the what the where and the when of all the information, okay? So let's have a look at this particular introduction. Now this introduction covers the what, the where and the when, and it skillfully includes the instructions while at the same time, it adapts the grammar to suit the new sentence structure. So there's no need to explain to the examiner what the X and the Y axis do. So that's my first rule for the masterclass, write an introduction. Okay, that's really, really important. 
So this is a good one. The chart and graph compare the number of Japanese who spent their holidays overseas from 1985 to 1995 with the proportion of them who visited Australia. Now, the next rule was to highlight the key features, and that was only the most important information and highlight the key features with figures as in this sample answer. Now in 1985, only about 5 million Japanese traveled abroad, after which the number increased steadily. By 1990, the figure had more than doubled to 11 million. Apart from a slight drop the following year, the upward trend continued until the end of the period when numbers reached over 15 million. So when you're highlighting the key features, the key features are what is the most of something? What is the least of something? Has the trend been a similar trend? Has there been continual growth? Or has there been a counter trend, something that's important or unusual? It's only the most important information that you need to describe. Now, this candidate chose to describe the bar chart first and then the line graph, okay? So while this is the line graph that's being described, while, the, while Australia was the destination for under 2% of Japanese tourists in 1985, that percentage had, had risen to over 6% by 1994. The proportion grew consistently, apart from a slight fall in 1990, 4.5% to 4%. After reaching its 1994 peak, the percentage declined marginally to 6% in 1995. So again, what was the least of something? What was the most of something? There was a steady, there was steady consistent growth, except for a slight fall in 1990. So think about the key features only. Please don't describe every detail in the graph. And pay attention to the units of measurement that the information's being given in. The data may be given in percentage, percentages or millions or hundreds of thousands. So pay attention to the range of units of measurement because if you get that wrong, you'll lose marks. Now, if you do have access to the band descriptors, you'll be able to see that if you don't include figures to highlight the key features, you'll only score a band five on that task achievement column. Because IELTS considers being able to use data to support key features a key writing skill, and that's what you're being tested on. You need to show that you're able to back up your facts with evidence. And as we know from the band descriptors, examiners assess your ability in writing to highlight the key features with figures. And as I said, just how well you do that is rated in the task achievement column. Okay, so check out that in the band descriptors. If you want to get a band seven, band seven says clearly presents and highlights the key features and that's what you're aiming to achieve. So remember what I said, just the most important information and always back it up. You'll only achieve a band six if you present and highlight the key features. You've got to clearly present and highlight the key features to achieve that band seven. So to recap, you've got to start with an introduction. You've got to highlight the key features with data. And my third rule is write an overview. Now, an overview is the most important message, usually written in just one sentence. It might be just after the introduction or in the conclusion, as in this example. It doesn't matter where it appears in your report, but it must be there. So here's an example of an overview. Overall, despite the relatively small proportion of Japanese tourists coming to Australia, the increase in the country's share of the Japanese tourist market corresponded closely with the growth in Japanese tourism overseas generally with a trebling of both in a 10 year period. So think of the overview as the most important information in a nutshell. It's a one sentence summary. 
And your skill of writing an overview is also assessed in the task achievement column. So again, if you look at those band descriptors, the highest score for task achievement you can get if you don't include an overview is a band five, where it says recounts detail mechanically with no clear overview. If you're aiming for a band seven, band seven says presents a clear overview. Okay. So the difference and in band six, it says presents an overview, but your overview um, to achieve a band seven will be much clearer than an overview in a band six, okay? And that's what you're all aiming for, I know, is your band seven. Now the examiners can read how many words you've written. So please make sure you write at least 150 words. Make sure that you've made effective comparisons. The task instructions say, make comparisons where relevant. So this still applies to stages of a process and please make sure you look at some process type of questions in your preparation. So for example, if we've seen um, a diagram of some brick manufacturing where the bricks are placed at higher temperatures or left for longer periods of time, that's something that you might be able to compare in those different stages of manufacturing. Now you must of course use the right text type or format for your answer. Academic uh, task one must be written as a factual report, not as a letter or a lecture, okay? And remember your answer must be written in connected, in connected text. So you'll lose marks if you write in note form or if you use bullet points or dot points or numbered lists. And then remember, you've only got 20 minutes on this task. So to see if you can leave yourself a little bit of time, a minute or so, to check for mistakes in grammar or spelling and be consistent in your use of verb tenses. So the common mistakes that people make, remember the task tells you to summarize the information by reporting the main features. Now this task is designed to be completed in 150 words or so. So if you write 200 words or more, please don't think the more you write, the better you'll do. If you've written more than 200 words, then you probably haven't been selective enough and you've included too much detail. So you should aim to just identify trends or patterns rather than describing every detail that occurs. Remember the task instructions, report the main features. Please don't interpret the information or speculate on why changes occurred. You're not asked to explain why, for example, there was a small decline in numbers of Japanese tourists in Australian, in Australia and Australia's share of tourists in the early nineties. Just report the information factually. And as we've seen, not using data to support the key features and not writing an overview are both mistakes that will lose you marks. Now, if you have to describe a process, as I mentioned before, let's give another example of how bees make honey. So you're given a series of pictures showing how bees make honey. Make sure you identify all the stages of the process and don't miss any of those stages out. And your overview will, in, will state how many stages are involved in that process, okay? Examiners will also be assessing on how well you use sequencing words to make clear the order of the stages in the process. So using phrases like the first stage, the following stage, after that, next in the final stage. And your ability to do that is rated under coherence and cohesion. So let's have a look now at the essay for task one, uh, sorry, for the academic and the general training module, you have to write an essay in task two. We don't have time to look at a general training task one letter in this webinar, but again, make sure if you're doing the general training module that you have a look at some examples of letters that you might have to write. 
Now, the essay types that you'll encounter, whether it's academic or general training, are both similar. So you'll either have an opinion essay to do, a discussion essay, a multi-part question, or it could be a multi-part question and opinion. And a multi-part question, number three or number four, are typical uh, questions that you'll come across in a general training essay. Now let's have a look at an opinion essay. Now remember, task two, the task two essay accounts for two thirds of your writing marks. So please make sure you spend that 40 minutes doing it. But you shouldn't start writing as soon as you see the task. First, you have to analyze the task and decide on the right approach to take because each task requires different approaches. So if we look at this question, some people believe the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity is a positive trend. So that's the topic. Here's what you have to do. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this opinion? Now, in this part of the question, you need to ask yourself, how many parts of this task do I need to address? Do I have to write about agreeing and disagreeing, or do I only have to write about one part, agreeing, for example. Now, remember, you've got 40 minutes to spend on this task, and it must be 250 words. Now, if you're looking at this question, you're probably thinking that you have to address two parts, because if you want to achieve a band seven, it says address addresses all parts of the task. But there's only one, you don't have to address two parts of this task. There's only one part. And this type of question requires only your position. Do you agree or disagree with this opinion? So it only requires your position, but it must be well developed with plenty of supporting ideas. It doesn't require the opposing viewpoint to be discussed. Although if you wanted to, you could, a balanced essay would also be acceptable, but your position as the writer must be clearly and consistently expressed throughout. Let's have a look at the next one. This is a discussion essay. So again, some people believe the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity is a positive trend. Others believe it's harmful to individuals. That's the topic. Here's what you have to do. Discuss both these views and give your own opinion. So again, if you're thinking to yourself, how many parts of this question do I need to address? This is where you find out. Discuss both these views and give your opinion. So you have to talk about why some people think increase, the increase of, of, of shopping as a trend is positive. And you have to talk about why some people think it's harmful and you have to give your opinion. So there are three parts of this task that you need to address, okay? And again, if you wanna get that band seven, you have to address all parts of the task. Our next essay type is a multi-part question and essay. Now, again, you've got to analyse the task first. So shopping is becoming more and more popular as a leisure activity. However, some people feel that this has both positive and negative effects. Why is shopping so popular? What effects does, it in, does its increase in popularity have on individuals and on society? So again, ask yourself, how many parts of this question do I need to address? Because I want to get that band seven where it says addresses all parts. Now you might think, oh, I have to talk about why shopping is so popular. And then I have to talk about the effects of shopping. So that's two parts, but I would suggest to you to go back and read it again, because there are three parts. You have to talk about why shopping is so popular. And you also have to talk about what effects its increase in popularity has on individuals. And you also have to talk about the effects that the increase in popularity has on society as well. 
Now, if you're looking at those band descriptors, if you only write about why shopping is so popular, or if you only wrote about the effects that shopping has on society, you would only get a band five because that says addresses the task only partially. And only addressing part of the task will limit you to a band five, whether you do academic or general training. So please spend that important time at the beginning analysing the tasks and making sure you're really clear on how many parts you have to write about. And our last question type, the multi-part essay and opinion. Remember, analyse the task and decide on the approach. How many parts are there to this question? There are problems with the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity. What form do these problems take? Do the problems outweigh the benefits of shopping as a leisure activity? Now, remember, there's a plural form in this question. What form do these problems take? Now, that doesn't mean you have to come up with a list of problems. Just make sure it's more than one. So write about a minimum of two problems. And then you only have to write about um, whether those problems outweigh the benefits. You only have to write about two of those. So you're gonna to have to describe any problems that are associated with the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity and an opinion about whether the problems outweigh the benefits, okay? Now the question kind of implies that both problems and benefits should be discussed, but to get band seven, candidates must cover both parts and you must focus on shopping as a leisure activity. So come up with a couple of problems and then talk about if those problems outweigh the benefits. Okay, so you can see that a different approach is needed from the previous task. Now, let me summarize the masterclass advice to you, highlighting the writing skills that the examiners are looking for and emphasizing the common mistakes I want you to avoid in this part of the test. Remember to allocate your time and spend 40 minutes on task two because it's worth more than task one, okay? It's worth twice as much as task one. You'll always be asked to present your point of view or a point of view. That's the writing skill you're being tested on in task two. So decide on your position and express your view clearly. Organize your ideas into paragraphs. So you should have an, a paragraph for your introduction, two or three paragraphs for the body and another paragraph for the conclusion. That's really important. And try to use a range of vocab and uh, grammatical structures. Always, and I said, I said this a lot before, just analyze the content. It's really, really important and use paragraphing and linking words to join your ideas together. Paragraphing is so important in that coherence and cohesion column. If you don't use any paragraphs, you'll only get a band five where it says may not use paragraphs or paragraphing may be inadequate. Okay, don't write in note form. Don't use headings or bullet points or numbered lists. Remember, it's an essay, so you've got to use connected text. And try to leave yourself enough time at the end to check your work carefully. Now, let's have a look at the speaking test. The speaking test is the same for both the academic and the general training module. One of the wonderful advantages of having an IELTS speaking test is it's is it is with a real life human being you don't have to talk into a computer and you're sitting face to face with an examiner which allows for real life communication between the candidate and the examiner now in the different um, parts of the test examiners are different are listening for different language skills so in part one the examiner is listening for your ability to talk about yourself to talk about your likes and your dislikes. And it's always important to be able to answer the question why. The examiner will ask you why a lot. 
especially when you're discussing what you like and dislike. So be prepared to give supporting reasons for your answer. Part two, you're being assessed on how well you're able to organise and present a short talk. And part three is your ability to participate in a two-way discussion. Now, examiners must keep timing in each part of the test because it is, after all, a standardised test. So to make sure that it's fair across the board for everyone, sometimes the examiner, especially if you're on a roll and you've got a lot to talk about, which is a great thing, but time um, permits you from talking for longer, the examiner may have to stop you or interrupt you. And they'll do that by saying thank you. And please don't worry about that. If they have to say thank you to you because time has run out, it's perfectly normal. So don't worry about that at all. When you're assessed in the speaking test, the examiners match your performance to the band descriptors. So again, if, you, if you've got a copy of the um, public version of the band descriptors, you'll be able to have a look at the criterion for a band seven. Now, fluency, you're matched on these four criteria. Fluency and coherence is how far you can maintain a flow of speech. So that means how well can you talk without pausing for too long or hesitating or giving a false start? Also, how well do you use connecting words and signaling words to make the relationship between your ideas clear? Lexical resource is the range and accuracy of your vocabulary. So whether you can express yourself precisely without repeating the same words and using the correct style. Grammatical range and accuracy is the range and complexity of your grammar and how accurately you can use it. And pronunciation is how well can you use pronunciation to convey and enhance meaning? So intonation is when our, word, when our words go up and down, as you're hearing my voice do as I'm speaking, how much does your accent cause strain for the listener? And all of our examiners are trained to have an international ear and all forms of standard English are acceptable. So if you speak more American English than British English, that's fine. But you must use or you must demonstrate that you can use a range of pronunciation features such as rhythm and stress and intonation. Make sure you talk at an appropriate speed with a good control of individual sounds. Now we're going to listen to an example speaking test of a woman called Kush. She was a band eight, okay, but have a listen to her speaking test. This is part three that you'll be listening to. Now we've been talking about a well-known person who you like or admire and I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions related to this. Let's consider first of all being in the public eye. Famous people are watched by everybody. What are yes. the advantages and disadvantages of that? Okay the advantages is uh, that a lot of people watching you so you become famous and uh, there are a lot of things which you can do correctly uh, and politically right uh, because, uh, you know, uh, there is media watching you and you can go ahead and pass the message to the media in a right way. The disadvantage is uh, that uh, you have to be diplomatically correct. At times, if there are certain things which are incorrect still you have to go ahead and do that yeah. which uh, doesn't make sense because a lot of political uh, leaders they they are into corruption uh, back in India and uh, uh, well uh, at times yeah there are some things which are wrong but they have to do it why do because, they have to do it because there's a lot of political pressure yeah. and uh, if they don't do it the political party would not support them and in the end they have to resign do you think the media plays a role in that? What is the media's approach to reporting uh, what famous people do? Well, media plays an important role. Uh, 
at times media will actually show things which are not correct or uh, you know if you see it it looks like yeah he's wrong but that's not the case so uh, yeah media plays a very important role they portray in a wrong manner at times and sometimes they do portray in a right manner can anything be done about that do you think oh uh, well uh, not really because uh, to in in today's world what has happened is everything is communicated by media television news internet uh, so you just have to go ahead and you know uh, probably call the media and do a meeting and answer questions uh, uh, to the public and give uh, justification and reasons very often the media reports on the most trivial things in, yeah. in important issues but people are fascinated by those things why are people fascinated by because uh, these days people like to listen to gossip and uh, trivial things they're not interested uh, in in the bigger part what's happening uh, they they have a simple life they would like to live it their way they are not bothered what what is happening within the country the only few people you see are really interested in uh, knowing about the country and you know uh, getting all the information and reacting. Let's uh, go on and talk about this celebrity culture. How are famous people used by advertisers nowadays? Uh, well, uh, f famous people are uh, really used for advertising because one, they can pro uh, promote the product and two, there are a lot of fans, their fans. So obviously if they are using that product, what will happen is those fans will actually use uh, that product. And uh, of course, it's a money-making business. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Mahatma Gandhi wore a, a watch of Swash, mm -hmm. oh, I would, wa you would wear it. Yeah, I would wear it. I was like, oh, he wore it, I'd wear it. The use of famous people in uh, advertising and other things, do you think that has a negative effect, especially on young people? Uh, at times, yes. There are some of the advertisements which are not meant or not, uh, uh, you know, they, they are offensive to younger generations. So uh, at times, yes. Do you think that famous people can influence public opinion beyond just selling things? They can make people vote differently or believe? Yes, they can. They influence a lot of people mm -hmm. today. Uh, even cricket cricketers or any kind of uh, famous personality, they influence uh, the public. Uh, you know, to do things. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, I'm fine with that as long as, uh, I mean, at times I do like, but then at times I don't like, so I don't bother much. All right. Well, thanks, Kush. That's the end of the speaking test. Thank you. Okay. So let's have a look at what uh, the examiner's comments were about Kush. Um, she is a clear example of a band aid, and her performance is consistently high across all the criteria. So remember, um, when I explained to you in the previous slide, in terms of fluency and coherence, Kush speaks fluently. She gives quite long and detailed responses without losing coherence. She does hesitate sometimes, but this is only related to the actual content of what she's saying and only occasionally to search for language. And she uses fillers such as, you know, I mean, and these cover up her hesitation. She also uses linking words and markers very naturally. Phrases like, that's not the case and I'm fine with that. Her lexical resource is wide and allows her to talk about a range of topics flexibly and precisely with many examples of excellent range. So political pressure into corruption, today's world, promote the product, a money-making business. So good use of collocation there. Only occasionally does she make any mistakes. She says, do a meeting and in a right manner. She also uses a wide range of grammatical structures with a high degree of accuracy and she makes only minor errors occasionally. 
And in regards to her pronunciation, she uses it well to reinforce meaning with, with rhythm, stress and intonation all used well. Okay, only occasional problems with word stress and some formation of the TH sound. So she's a clear example of a band eight, okay? So let's have a look at the masterclass advice. Try to do as much as you can in English before the test. Try to speak at a steady pace. Now in part one of the test, you're always gonna be asked about the work you do or about um, do you work or are you a student or about where you live? So it's good to have practiced what you can say about where you live and what you do, but avoid memorizing answers, okay? They won't sound natural and you won't get marks for language that's been memorized. Speed of delivery is also important. So a common mistake, because you'll be nervous, is to speak too quickly in the texts, in the test. So just try and speak at a nice regular pace. In part two, you're given uh, paper and pencil to make some notes. So write down any keywords that you can use for each point of the task card you're given. Use the four points to structure your two minute talk and use the key vocab in your notes to help develop each point. The fourth point always asks you to explain something. So this is the one which gives you the most to talk about. Choose fillers that you think are appropriate. So in, instead of hesitating or going, um, uh, uh, you know, say, oh, hang on, let me think about that for a moment. Or, gee, that's a good question. I've never thought about that before. Um, and, you know, Kush didn't allow any mistakes to stop her. She, If she made a mistake, she just kept going. And practice giving extended answers to questions and always be prepared to give reasons for your answers. Like I said before, the examiner will ask you why. And the type of topics that you're given are, again, a wide range of topics. So don't worry, you'll be able to talk about the task that you're given. And always try to smile when you're doing the test and try and relax. Um, try and relax. There'll be a digital recorder there recording the test. Just pretend that it's a mobile phone in front of you. Now, we, we don't have time to do a practice listening test in this webinar, but let me just quickly run through the listening test. It's the same for both the academic and the general training module. There are four sections in the listening test and each section gets more difficult. This gives candidates with strong listening skills the chance to show how well they can do. Now, there are different types of questions on the listening test, just like there is in the reading test. So you might have gap fill questions, matching words to diagrams or tables or maps, or sentence completions, or short answers to open questions, or you might have to complete notes in a summary or a table, or there might be multiple choice. And if you're doing the paper-based test, you're given a listening test booklet and an answer sheet. Write your answers on the answer booklet as you go. And then you're given 10 minutes at the end of the test to transfer your answers over onto the question paper. But of course, if you're doing the computer-based test, you'll be answer, answer, entering your answers onto the screen as you go. So use your time. You're always given extra time at the beginning of each section to read through the questions. So use that time to read through the questions. And then you're given time to check your answers before going on to the next section. So use that time wisely. Don't waste it. If you read the questions first, then you know in advance what you have to listen for and you're more likely to hear the right answer. When you've read the questions for the next section, again, try to think of synonyms or words relate or words that you might expect to hear. So, for example, if there's a question about climate change, think of related vocabulary that you might hear. For example, global warming, rising sea levels and so on, and keep these in mind when you're listening. You've got to be able to multitask in the listening test. So you've got to look at more than one question at a time and try to be one step ahead. So for example, if you're up to question three, you need to be looking ahead to question four. 
the questions on your question paper follow the order of the recording. So if you miss question three, but hear question four, leave question three, go on to question four and then question five. You can go back to question three at the end of that section if you have time, okay? As with the reading test, never leave a blank space, always try and guess your answer. And a speaker's intonation or tone of voice can indicate their attitude to something, either positive or negative. So this can also be helpful in finding the right answer. Okay, we're nearing the end of our webinar. We're approaching um, question time. So just make the most of your every opportunity to use English. Decide which module you're going to do, the academic or the general training. And remember, IELTS preparation courses are great if you haven't done the test before, but if you have done an IELTS preparation course and taken the test and not got the score you need, an IELTS preparation and doing another IELTS preparation course won't help you to improve because it only maximizes the English skills that you already have, okay? Getting an IELTS Band 7 represents thousands of hours of, of learning English and using it. So take a long-term approach, okay, and push yourself everywhere, every day, at every time. Now, this is a good slide to take a screenshot of. It's got some resources on there. The IELTS Essentials website's good, as well as IELTSIDP.com. There's also a Facebook page, which is interactive and you can have questions answered. And there's a load of stuff on YouTube to help you as well. There um, is an IELTS progress check so that you can do a mock test that will give you an idea about how you're tracking. And you can select from the academic or the general training module. So the next webinar is the IELTS writing task one and you'll get some live feedback from an IELTS expert on the 1st of July at, um, at 5 p.m. So I think we've arrived at question time. I've run a little bit over time. My apologies for that. I got a bit carried away in parts. But Sam, do you have any questions for me? We do. Uh, again, brilliant, brilliant masterclass as always, Tina. I think there's consistently so much IELTS knowledge on show. And yeah, mm. I'm excited for you to, to share some more IELTS knowledge now. Um, but don't worry about running over time. It's all about educating the test takers and you always do an amazing job at that. Uh, we have some questions. Are you ready to hear them? Mm-hmm. Sure am. All right. Question one. Uh, what are some ways to sharpen listening skills for non-native English speakers? With or for non-native English, non speakers. English speakers? I think listening to the radio, listening to talk back radio is really good. The ABC um Radio is um, is very good. It's all talking. There's not a lot of commercials on there. So that's something to help you improve your listening. Also watching television as well and or movies in English. But And, of course, you can't be practising your speaking with a native speaker. That helps your listening as well. But I would definitely recommend um, ABC Radio. Or podcasts. There's loads of stuff out there in English. Podcasts is another good one. Yeah, I agree. Podcasts are an amazing one. And I think they're mm. very easily accessible from all across the world. Yeah. Um, perfect answer. Thank you. Uh, question two. This is, I think, a really good one. Uh, many people suffer from stage fright or stage fear coming up to their IELTS test. How would you recommend candidates try to overcome this? Deep breathing. Really seriously deep breathing can help a lot. And usually I think the candidates feel most nervous before their um, speaking tests and before the um, other parts of the test as well. So just sort of breathing deeply in through your nose and really filling up your belly with air on the count of five, holding it in for three and then releasing it onto the count of five. And doing that four or five times, you'll, you'll really start to slow your body down and calm your mind. But deep breathing, is my number one go-to for any stress or nerves. Yeah, I agree. I always really enjoy your answers on stress and anxiety. So I think you answered them perfectly. So thank you, Tina. <laughs> thank uh, you. Question three, very similar. How do you think I can reduce my stress and worry while reading during the IELTS test? Well, again, using those skills that we talked about in the reading 
part of the test. Just focus on reading the questions first. Keep your attention on do I have to skim, scan or read for detail and um, just keep those questions in your mind Don't and you're breathing deeply. Don't let your nervousness get the better of you. You've really got to focus a lot on the on the speaking test and ho uh, on the reading test rather so um hopefully by just again just doing some deep breathing some positive affirmations i can do this i've got this um i'm gonna get there and then read those questions first think about do i have to skim scan and read for detail you'll be too busy uh, working through your reading test to feel nervous after the first minute or so i'm sure yeah, I completely agree. Great answer. Um, always so insightful. <laughs> uh, question four, will my score be affected if I lie about something in the speaking or writing test? For example, if I give an answer in writing part two that is not necessarily true, but is relevant to the question? No, no, you won't lose marks at all. The examiner won't know if it's true or not. And often candidates make up statistics and things to, to prove their point. So no, that's perfectly that's perfectly fine. I kind of discourage candidates from lying in the speaking test because, you know, if the examiner, if you're telling a lie and then the examiner asks you why, sometimes it might be hard to, to support your answer if it's not true to you and that can get you into a little bit of hot water. But on the writing test, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. I think it is good to avoid a web of lies on the speaking test. Yes, yes. <laughs> I can see that going badly. Yeah. Uh, our final question for tonight, uh, another really good one. Uh, when writing about a process or describing an illustration, should you use your own knowledge and experience to give extra information not required in the question? No, absolutely not. Only describe what is there. Um, because again, if you're going to be putting, remember the questions are, be, are designed to be answered within 150 words. So if you're going to give extra information because you've got extra knowledge, then um, chances are you'll go over that 150 words and the examiner will just think, well, there's extra detail here that's not needed. So um, just look at the question and just answer what's in the question with the information that you're given. Amazing answer to close on. And again, amazing answers as always. I think they're always so apt and to the point and cover everything perfectly. Thank uh, you, Sam. It's excellent. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the questions we have time for tonight, but thank you for joining us. And we hope you learned a lot about how you can move your score a little bit closer to a band seven. A uh, huge shout out and thank you to Tina for running the masterclass so informatively uh, for the answers you've just taken us through. Uh, and also a big thank you to the team behind the scenes uh, making this webinar possible. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with our next webinar where we'll walk through an IELTS writing task one with live expert feedback. Uh, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us and good night. Thank you.